Good morning and welcome. Welcome to How to Become a Web Accessibility Ally. First, an introduction to OOMF. OOMF is a full service web agency headquartered in Providence, Rhode Island, with remote employees all over the United States. We help companies with digital strategy, user experience design, and open source content management systems. Our clients have included Blue Cross Blue Shield Rhode Island, the RISD Museum, Leica Geo Systems, and NBC Sports, among others. We are passionate about Drupal, a popular open source platform. Our development team is Acquia certified, and few of us have received extra training in accessibility. We have a strong involvement in the community by speaking and sponsoring conferences, contributing code to open source projects, hosting meetups, and further, one of our teammates has been hosting a podcast about Drupal for several years. Your hosts for this webinar are myself, Jay Hogue, and my teammate, Kathy Beck. I am Director of Design and UX, and that means that I have a scientific, research, and technical side in user experience, as well as a visual side in user interface design. I love typography, accessibility, and the power of CSS and HTML. Hi, everyone. I'm Kathy Beck. I'm a senior UX engineer at OOMF. I've been working in Drupal for over 10 years now. As a UX engineer, I'm usually site building and theming Drupal 8 projects. For the past few years, I've been digging into everything accessibility. We'll have time for Q&A at the end, so if you have questions that come up during the presentation, drop them in the Q&A chat. So we'd like to start by doing a little mind reading of the audience and supposing, why are you here? Well, accessibility is something that we should all care about, but it does take work to understand why it's so important and it takes work to empathize with anyone that might benefit. Some of you in the audience might be starting to become aware of what accessibility on the web means and you're here to understand more about why it is, what it is and why it's important. Some of you might know people who benefit greatly from inclusive websites already. So you understand why it's important, but you'd like to know more about the how. Still, a few of you might have been thrown into all of this rather abruptly. Maybe other people in your circle who own businesses have faced some recent litigation. Maybe you simply know that litigation in this space is a thing that's happening. That's an okay reason, it's certainly rooted in reality, but we hope that this webinar will help move past the fear and into the realm of understanding and caring about doing what is right for your customers. And finally, you probably did not come here thinking that an investment in accessibility can translate to bottom line rewards, but it's true. A common misconception is that accessibility is very expensive and it doesn't add value. But in fact, the return on investment can be great. Accessibility increases your customer base and therefore your conversion rates. The more people that can use your website, the more potential engagement you can have. With that, no matter the reason, welcome. We're glad you're here. Let's get started with a little bit of a history lesson. In 1990, access to public buildings became codified into law with the passage of the Americans with Disabilities Act under President H.W. Bush. It was an extension of the Civil Rights Act of 1964, and it granted people with disabilities the same rights as anyone else passing both houses with wide support. In 2006, the first major court case to cite the ADA appeared, where a major retailer, Target, was sued because their website was not accessible to the blind. Since then, the ADA has been used in numerous court cases to enforce inclusion online. In the world of architecture where the ADA was born, we should be able to find inspiration as designers have become very good at working within these guidelines. It's not stopped them from producing stunningly beautiful spaces, like the Disney Concert Hall seen here by Frank Gehry. The importance of the ADA is easy to understand when we, see, when we think about it in these public spaces, because we can see that different people have different ways of moving through the world, walkers and strollers and wheelchairs and canes and the like. On the web, however, it's easier to ignore it because you can't as easily see how people use your website unless you've struggled with it yourself. That means that much of the web right now, unfortunately, is inaccessible to a majority of users. A 2016 study in the UK found that 70% of websites had usability issues. 
The study then extrapolated the spending power of that group of users who would, quote, click away from an inaccessible site. They calculated that UK businesses were leaving up to $11 billion on the table. A similar study was done in the US, and the picture was just as grim. Web AIM tested a million home pages with automated tools. The results were stark. Only 2.8% of home pages passed the test. Since automated tools may not surface errors that a human user would encounter, the actual number of home pages without an accessibility error might be closer to 1%, or 10,000 sites out of a million. It's not all bleak, though. Of the problems that were detected, a large portion of them are easy to fix, which means they have happened out of carelessness or neglect, not out of malice. We'll talk more about these common issues later on. The thing that we forget when talking about disabilities is that any one of us can become temporarily disabled. We need to think more broadly about accessibility because it's not just for a small subset of the population. The numbers around the permanently, permanently disabled population don't tell the whole story though. According to the most recent census, however, the numbers are substantial. So 57 million Americans reported having a disability in the last census, which is one in five. It breaks down into different groups. About 8% have difficulty lifting or grasping. 6% have a cognitive condition. 3% have a severe vision impairment and another 3% have a severe hearing impairment. A little more than half of these folks go online regularly. And in this age where banking, healthcare, and work-related tasks are all online, that should not be a surprise. While one in five Americans is notable, we should get beyond that because it's not the whole story. The Microsoft inclusion team has it right when they say that ability is a spectrum. What we call normal abilities can be impermanent. They can be temporary like an injury, but also temporary based on the situation that a person is in. A new parent is likely to, to conduct their daily tasks with only one hand, holding their newborn in the other. A driver needs turn-by-turn -turn directions read out loud so they can keep their eyes on the road. A bartender will have trouble hearing while at work. And voice inputs like Siri and Alexa need to account for heavy accents. Would we have called any of these people disabled just because they're in situations that limit their senses and abilities? Our products need to support those who are blind, sure, but also those whose eyesight is just simply not as good as it used to be. If your product relies on sound, can someone with an ear infection use it? Does your voice controlled product also provide, also provide manual control for those that are nonverbal or sick? The folks that we normally think of when we hear disability are only part of the landscape. So let's look at some numbers again in this new light. At any given point, the number of people who would benefit from an inclusive website is far greater than we might expect. So as one example, the number of Americans who have only one arm is low at about 26,000 people out of roughly 327 million. But add to that 13 million people who break an arm every year and then add again 8 million new parents holding newborns all the time, and you have about 21 million people, or 12%, who might need to use your website with only one hand at any given time. Not to mention people that might be driving and using their phone, <clears throat> don't do that, or holding onto a subway railing while hurtling from one station to another. Now multiply that by your average customer value, if you have one, and you might arrive at a staggering number. Beyond possible returns on investment when designing and developing with accessibility in mind, there can be unexpected ways in which you might be supporting all other methods of consuming your content. An anecdote that I love is from an article that I stumbled across called Generation Z Loves Closed Captioning. So those words at the bottom of a screen that we intended for the deaf or hard of hearing are being used by young folks when they multitask. It helps them focus. People also use closed captioning when they're in a loud environment and they can't hear the audio, or when they're in a quiet one and the sound might disturb others. So don't think about the cost of adding closed captioning to your video content as a benefit for only that small segment of the population who are deaf. There's a much larger population that can benefit from alternate modes of presenting content. To wrap up this section, 
your definition of disability should have expanded by now. It's not a personal health condition. It's the way in which a person deals with the world and the things that are in it. So it's a mismatch between how I can interact with a thing and how that thing has been designed to be interacted with. The solution to the problem of how can we make the web more inclusive is that we need better design and we need to intend to be accessible. We can get better too when we understand what good accessibility looks like. So now Kathy is going to jump in and show some simple real world examples. Hey folks, it's Kathy again. We created this simple form to just demonstrate the power that comes out of the box with clean, well-formed HTML code or markup. When you come across a poor form experience, therefore it can most likely be blamed on the designer, <clears throat> Jay. We've used many of the default semantic form elements to make this form useful and understandable. The large boxes around groups of fields are called field sets. They will always have a legend, which is the vis visual text of each grouping of fields. The common use case for field sets is when there is a billing and a shipping address fields in the same form. Therefore, a unique field set in legend make it more clear which address fields we want to put, put in the input. Here we are going to show three different fields, visual bubbles of what VoiceOver for Mac OS will read out loud when an element of a form is being used. First is a field label, then if the field is required or not, followed by what kind of user interaction is needed, then the placeholder text read in a slightly different tone then the name of the field set group that it belongs to. Here is how voiceover sounds when reading the first name field in Mac Safari. First name required edit text chain in the email group. You are currently on a text field. You enter a field. Right. A few things to note on this example. We have added a few best practices to the form that might not always be applied by default. For example, we are hiding the asterisks from screen readers because it will read star, which doesn't provide context for this field being required, and it can be confusing to users. We also added the visually hidden word group to the end of each field set's legend. This gets screen readers to announce name and email group, which makes more sense than just name and email. So remember, there are ways to add context to users of assistive devices while also ignoring elements meant for visual users. Here's an animated GIF of what keyboard tabbing looks like through a form. Most people probably don't know that once your cursor is inside the page, with a form, pressing the tab key will advance the cursor to the next field. The shift tab will move the cursor back to the previous field. This is really helpful when you want to fill out a form quickly. It's another feature that benefits a larger group, not just those that can't use a mouse. In a radio button group, the arrows, or in the select list, you can use the arrow keys to simply or simply start typing the first letter in your, that you're looking for. Here we select Rhode Island, and then we type a V for Vermont, and R to go back to Rhode Island. Then with checkboxes, the space bar will check or uncheck the field. The blue ring around the field inputs is part of inclusive design. It's called the focus indicator. That's where the cursor is presently focused within your page. Without that visual indicator, folks who prefer to use a keyboard instead of a mouse would not know until they started typing which field they were adding data to, or if they were even in a form field at all. Using a keyboard is a way in which people with difficulties with fine motor movements will usually navigate all websites. 
it's a great example of being inclusive and benefiting a large group of people, not just folks who have issues with motor skills benefit, but savvy web users who know about keyboard tabbing can fill out your forms much faster. This is something that you can test out right now on yours or someone else's website. Give it a try. You'll quickly see how your forms might perform. This was an example of a bare bones form with very minimal styles adding. With a little more effort, we can make this form look a lot nicer while still being accessible to all users. Notice that when the form is coded with best practices in mind, users are able to click the text of the label, which moves the cursor's focus to the input field. This is another great feature for power users, but also great for people who have difficulty with precision, like those with mild tremors or carpal tunnel. Here we are showing the same HTML form, the same keyboard navigation, but with some design customization and more validation feedback on what is being entered into the field. We added a color indication for success, but also an icon. If someone is colorblind, you don't want to rely on color change alone to denote success or failure. In a more robust example, we would show messages in input data failures to let the user know that what kind of data the field expects and what they can do to correct the problem. Actually, in an even more robust example with something very particular like creating a new password, the instruction should be visible at all times, letting the user know from the very beginning what criteria is needed in that field. Finally, we added a subtle bounce effect to the button at the end to make it look more like it is being pressed. This effect is present for both keyboard and mouse users. In the design effort to add this, only required a little bit of extra effort. Now that you've seen one small aspect of how the web has been designed to be inclusive, hopefully you can't forget it. You didn't know what you didn't know, but now you know a little more. Empathy is very important when it comes to understanding how others might interact with the world. There are many, many ways to do it, and they are all equally valid. Our job is to make content accessible, regardless of the tools being used. Jay reviewed some history, some of the business reasonings. You have seen a real world example of what a well-designed accessible form can look like. Now we'd like to briefly discuss why accessibility requirement investment requires investment and extra effort. There's a lot of great accessibility that you can get out of the box with open source software. A large and diverse community has contributed their ideas and their efforts into making these platforms accessible to all. Both of these projects, Drupal and WordPress, have internal accessibility initiatives that focus on making the core product inclusive. As soon as, as, soon as customizations start to happen on these platforms, however, efforts need to be put in place to maintain accessibility. It needs to be a line item in your project. Common accessibility problems can arise from a few different places, one of them being custom themes. A theme developer may not have a commitment to accessibility at all. The same goes for community developed modules or plugins. These free solutions might come with the burden of maintaining and updating them to be compliant with your organization's accessibility goals. The same can be said for third-party widgets that are embedded on your site, like widgets from Instagram or comment moderating platforms like Discuss. In some cases, your site is responsible if the third-party widget is inaccessible. So before using an externally hosted tool like these, you should investigate how accessible they are. And finally, some problematic features that always pose some accessibility risks are HTML forms, as you've seen, and elements like modal windows or pop-ups that 
interrupt the user's experience. We should always be thinking about the non-visual or keyboard-only users when making desi design decisions like these. In addition to all these considerations, there is also your content. In some cases, your website's content will be the major factor in getting a passing grade on an accessibility audit. One common problem can include header, I, header hierarchy. Here we show some examples of bad page headings. We used more than one heading level one H1 and jumped from an H1 to an H3 without an H2 in between. The page outline matters for accessibility, but it will also help your SEO. Google still recommends no more than one H1 per page. So a good page outline would use a single H1, then a logical order of elements like H2, H3, and H4. So now Jay's gonna jump back in and discuss some other common content and visually accessibility issues. Thanks, Kathy. So I'd like to touch on images because this is a very common issue that we see all the time. Images need to have alt text and be described in a way that supports the message of your content. This is actually a pretty deep subject that we wrote a whole blog post about. Questions around how your organization wants to describe content can be many. To make things more complicated, when an image does not add value to the page content, when it's just fluff, it should not be described for screen readers. This is a difficult line item to tackle. Properly formed image tag looks like this, with the alt text in place. Like most things, what is good for accessibility is also really good for SEO. So this image description is also part of your content now. But remember, like I said, if the image does not contribute to the content, if describing it would just confuse the reader, don't describe the image at all, but do remember to keep an empty alt tag present. When should images be described and how they should be described should be part of any accessibility plan and any organization's editorial guidelines going forward. Another common problem is insufficient color contrast. Will someone with low vision or issues perceiving color be able to read your content? You'd be surprised how many corporate brand guidelines do not have contrast ratios that meet these guidelines. We care enough about getting colors to be legible that we built a tool for ourselves to evaluate project color palettes. And we have improvements in mind to help suggest changes to colors without affecting the overall goals of a corporate brand guide. Also, is there enough contrast between a link inside a paragraph of text like these that'll be understood as a link? Color alone should not be the only indication that a link is present within a string of text which is why a default text link in all browsers includes an underline. And that's why in our form examples, we introduced an icon in addition to the color when the input was valid or when it had an error. And finally, in the realm of content, there is a pet peeve of mine that I'd like to bring up. We often see web authors use the convention of click here or learn more, and designers do it as well. There's a few things wrong with this habit. First, these four letters are a small touch target. The smaller the target, the more concentration someone needs to tap it or click it. And if there are other links in its vicinity, they might press the wrong one. Most importantly though, we have an element on the page that receives special design attention. It stands out because it's a link, but the language has no context to it. When someone skims the page and looks at the links, they don't know what clicking on here will do. In a similar way, screen readers can have the page announce only the links. Therefore, they can skim the page much the same way that a visual user might. But if they do, they'll hear the words, here, link, learn more, link, without any context. What will the link do? And again, what is good for accessibility is also good for other things. So in this case, the SEO of your links is poor. Robots crawl the page links in much the same way that a screen reader reads the content out loud, and Google establishes context, just like a person does. So when linking to content, you're doing yourself a disservice when you're trapped in these bad habits. 
So we mentioned guidelines a few times, and as you may or may not know, there are agreed upon industry standards that designers, developers, and site owners can use as a guide to achieve inclusion. The challenge and opportunity is that these standards are a flexible set of guardrails around certain features. They're not a hard set of rules, but rather they're meant to be a set of recommendations that a site owner can use to craft what a good experience might look like for their own audience. The Web Content Accessibility Guidelines, or WCAG, have three levels that site owners can choose from to create their own standard of conformance. Level A is the baseline. Many of these requirements are easy to meet, like the previously mentioned rule about adding a design element to links that distinguishes it from plain text. Level AA is what the Department of Justice has been using and what most ADA cases in the courts cite as the minimum for conformance. For your own audience's needs, you might designate a few features that should actually meet level AAA. These should be decisions that are made with your business goals in mind, because remember, the more people that can access your content, the more engagement you can see on your site. The WCAG website offers a filterable list of criteria that can be tailored to your accessibility goals. Each criteria shows what common failures look like and has techniques for creating success. So understanding the guidelines and how they can be used to support your business goals is the first step that we need to take. The second step is to plan. Start with a plan. If your organization needs to remediate an existing web property, create a plan that includes business goals and priorities. What are the most important, impactful things to fix? If your organization is on the cusp of a major redesign or replatform, well, start planning for improved accessibility now. You can bet that when a big construction company starts to build, they have a plan in place. They know that the structure will have certain features, and they know that you can change the find something like the color up to the last minute, but to change the structure halfway through the build is going to cost a lot of money. So start planning now. If you're still in the learning stage for your organization, you can self-assess. There are lots of tools that can be used to scan your website for common issues. You can use your own website in a new way, like with a keyboard as we showed you, or if you're really curious, turn on VoiceOver for the Mac and iPhone, or TalkBack for Android. The testing tools that we recommend are the Wave tool from WebAIM, which is a browser extension for Chrome that can run on any website. It shows feedback on color contrast, semantic structure, HTML validation, and the page outline. The Axe tool from Deke is also very powerful. But if you're SEO savvy, you might already be familiar with a tool like Google's Lighthouse, when in, which in addition to SEO scoring, offers some accessibility feedback and uses the Axe engine to identify them. Finally, Oomph can prepare a report for your website that includes automated tool testing, as well as manual human testing with three of the major screen readers, JAWS and NVDA for Windows, and VoiceOver for Mac and the iPhone. From the report, we can prepare remediation plans for our team to implement or as a guide for your own internal teams, as well as additional verification after remediation has been completed. All that said, we also want to offer a word of caution. Some organizations offer services that include a quote certificate to verify that your site is compliant. The fact is, there's no recognized certification that a site owner can receive by any organization. These certificates and statements do nothing to remove liability in the event of arbitration. They are individual products that specialists sell in order to deliver something that frankly feels tangible. In reality though, it's just a piece of paper like any other. So don't be entranced by the promise of a certificate. A site that may, might be 100% compliant today can lose that compliance tomorrow when a new page of content or an untested feature is introduced. Accessibility is a moving target, one that we should aim for, but one in which we might not always hit 100% of the time. The point is to make the effort, to know what good accessibility looks like, and to be open and honest with your audience when something creates a barrier to their use. Diversity includes being prepared for a diverse audience of devices, not just mobile devices and laptops and desktops, but also screen readers and joysticks and keyboards and puff sticks. It's not enough to invite these devices and the people behind them to your party. You have to ask them to dance by giving them a great experience 
regardless of those devices. The result is a larger and more diverse group of happy customers that have had a fantastic ex experience, who feel included and are ready to become evangelists for your brand and your products. So thank you for listening. And now that we have some time to open up the floor to questions, use the Q&A feature to send us one. So one of the ones we get a lot, uh, this is common, um, don't have a budget right now, but what can I do in the short term to help with accessibility? Well, actually, um, some of the examples that we had towards the end of the presentation are really great. Um, they're all about auditing your content. Uh, heading, the heading order, alt text on images, um, anything that some of these tools will uh, surface that are part of the content, part of what uh, we presume you have immediate access to, those are great things to start with. Um, keep in mind, you know, some things you, you have, uh, some things in the header and the footer, those are going to be for a developer to change once and hopefully they'll change everywhere on the entire site but your content is unique on a page by page, blog post by blog post basis. And so it's gonna take a long time to go through that and make sure all of those issues are addressed. So I would say that's always a great place to start. Uh, Kathy, I think there's another one here we can go over quickly. Um, what are the most difficult accessibility problems to address? Um, there are a few, but the the, the hardest one I found uh, from a front end standpoint, so um, when something changes on the page, uh, a load more automatically happens, a, a search is performed and the result count changed. Every change that happens needs to be announced to the user. Um, we've loaded, lazy loaded 12 more images, you scroll a little more, we've loaded 12 more images. Um, it has to be told. Right, they have to be, a screen reader won't see those changes happen, so they have to be announced in some way. Um, those can be difficult things to program and the language around them, again, it comes down to content, um, can sometimes be difficult to agree upon. Um, another one here, are any tools you recommend for color contrast? Uh, there are actually quite a few out there uh, we had the one um, a few slides back that we put a link up to, but there's another one that I like quite well. Um, there's accessible-colors.com, there's colorcontrast.com. Um, <laughs> there's quite a few actually if, if, you, if you Google um, some of those terms. Color contrast to me does a really nice job of describing what the thresholds are um, for the different levels because it can be confusing. You have level A, uh, that you can hit for small text and large text, then you have tri level AAA for small text and large text. So it's difficult to understand sometimes which ones you want to use as your target and what large text is or what small text is. Um, and those, that, that array of tools, um, all of them do different things well, um, but I, colorcontrast.com for me is, is the one that I end up going to the most and the one that I would like to emulate a little bit more closely with the tool that we've built internally. Um, so one more uh, common, so what are the common problems with keyboard tabbing in forms? Um, I'll go over that quickly. So one of the things that happens sometimes is you might have a hidden field to uh, trap a spam bot. Well, if someone using their keyboard tabs into that hidden field, it'll look like the cursor has completely disappeared. They won't know where it went. That's a common issue. We need to make sure that a keyboard experience will skip a hidden field and not get trapped. Um, and generally, I, you know, really, I think the biggest issue with keyboard tabbing and, and forms in general is feedback, help text. You know, what kind of data do we expect in which input? How do you form that? How do you prevent people from making an error? Kathy? Also, um, when the form is submitted and there's an error, the focus should go on the first field in that form that has an error to give the, the user a direct uh, way to fix that field and not have to look through the form to find it. Yeah. 
Okay. So we did go a little bit over on time, but thank you for your feedback. Thank you for your questions. Thank you for sticking with us until the end. Um, we are available on, ooh, I did not advance the slide. There we go. We're available for uh, questions and conversations uh, afterwards. Please uh, do feel free to check us out on our website. We have a number of blog posts that address some of these topics in more in depth. And certainly uh, you can reach us out to us individually if you have specific questions or if you'd like to talk more about your organization's needs around accessibility and inclusion coming up. So thanks again. Um, Thanks for joining and we hope to hear from you soon. Thanks.